Hello, everybody, and welcome to the History Roundtable. Um, we have a few housekeeping announcements, as usual. Uh, first of all, we're very glad that everybody's here. And then, of course, we have coffee, and in honor of our program today, fresh veggies and our delicious cookies, as usual. So those are available over on the serving table, coffee and tea in the back. So please help yourself at any time to those. And um, the bathrooms are to my right, your left, go around behind the screens there, and they are located back on that side of the room. And we want to thank the St. Anne Parish for hosting us, as they have now for many, many meetings, and we appreciate this place very much. I uh, also want to thank Walter Peckham for doing our sound today, uh, which is really an important part of our program, if you can hear it. And then finally, a special thanks to MCAT. As always, this presentation is being recorded by Missoula Community Access Television, and it's part of a media assistance grant that they have uh, granted to us for this uh, program. And if you, for any reason, want to go back and hear a past program, you can do that by going to MCAT.org and uh, clicking on 189 is the channel that we're on, and they, you can look for our programs on demand. So just type in what the subject that you're looking for in the search box, and it'll come up, and you can enjoy uh, just like you were here the first time. So um, we'll go up right into our program now. Gardening has been a part of Bonner since the earliest days. And so today, Hooligan, who is uh, also known as Glenn Max Smith when he's called by his proper name, and Jennifer Stackpole of Wicked Good Greens are going to explore the rather remarkable progression of, of gardening that's going on here in Bonner. So, Hooligan. All right. You guys ready for this? Yeah. <laughs> Back. Good to see you here. Yeah. How about them kids on that old shade old Come You still? <laughs> okay. Everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Last time I was up here, I talked about Hazel Beetle and how dedicated she was for that Milltown Library. And come to think of it, as Hazel was doing that over here at about 1918, we were, as Hazel mentioned, we were at war with old Kaiser Bill there in World War I. So Kenneth Ross, the plant manager at the time, decided we should have some victory gardens. So he set aside 11 acres for the victory gardens. Eventually they were called community gardens out here. So he set those up. We also had a, a second garden. It was quite a bit smaller. It was only two acres. And they raised the vegetables for the logging camp crews. And those boys, they worked hard. Uh, we got a few loggers in here. Ed worked in the camps. Well, I imagine they didn't have the camps in, but anyway, Ed was a logger. Bill Walker drove many a log truck. So those boys, it was labor intensive to work in that wood screw, and that's putting it mild. So when it comes to supper time, you better have something that they like to eat, or you're not going to get no production out of them. 
Come to find out through uh, uh, some research I did with uh, Mighty Smith, there was a Missoulian, Missoulian article that explained that they like their fresh corn on the cob. And they grew a lot of that in that two acre patch. And where that sat is if you've driven down through Bonner, you'll see the old office building, the old White House. You'll see a big mound of dirt right behind it where our dry kills used to sit. And that's where the lumberjacks garden was. And I've put it on the map here. Our community gardens was the, again, the 11 acre patch that sat way back by the river, right out the back door of the sawmill. So when you think of a sawmill, who's going to think of gardens, you know? That's sawdust, logs, lots of noise, smoke, soot, ashes. But here we got this beautiful garden, and they were. A lot of stuff was grown there. Each one of those plots was divided up. They were 30 feet, 33 feet wide, 80 feet long. So going back to hazel beetles, Scandinavians, Finlanders, French Canadians, Norwegians, Swedes, they now had their books to read in that library, but they also had some damn nice gardens over here. And uh, the one requirement was, if you work for the mill, you got a good rental fee. Sometimes there wasn't a charge, but you did have to keep the weeds out of them. That was one of the duties of uh, a fellow by the name of Mr. Hart. He was a company store manager. So, at this time, when these gardens were going, Warren G. Harding was the 29th President of the United States. Uh, there was a real delightful story about this time that was told by a Mrs. Daggett. She was interviewed by the Missoulian, and she gives a list of what she raised and preserved. I have it here in a little picture I put together. And I would imagine at the time I'd have to I'd have to refer to Shirley on this. If possibly Hazel might have canned a lot of her stuff in one of these glass top jars. I'm thinking she might have. But anyway, if she did, or even if she did use the modern cannon jar, she put up seventy five quarts of beans. 20 quarts of corn. She grew 25 gallons of pickles, 22 gallons of sauerkraut, and that's not including the tomatoes, turnips, potatoes, and onions that she grew. And she was very proud of that. In fact, she kind of competed with the company gardener who raised the produce for the uh, logging camps. Okay, now let's, let's talk about the old hooligan here. When I came to Bonner, old Harry Truman was president of the United States. And Bonner, I'll have to say, it was kind of like a chapter out of Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn, as far as Ed, Bill, myself, as far as we went, we had a hell of a good, heck of a good time out here. <laughs> <laughs> Water at that time uh, hasn't changed much. It was a beautiful little town, had board sidewalks. If you ever walked down a board sidewalk in the wintertime, that snow makes a crunch on those board walks. It's unforgettable. Anyway, the houses were very well maintained. I was talking to Jennifer about the rental fees. Some of them rental fees was $15 a month and up. And what are they now, about 1,500? <laughs> they did insulate it back then. They weren't, they weren't insulated. And if I remember right, we had to, the average house out here took about seven cords of wood to keep that thing warm in the wintertime. And then getting up early in the morning wasn't, wasn't that cool. Well, it was too, too cool. <laughs> you get out of that nice warm bed with homemade quilts and everything and try to get dressed and get out for breakfast and go to school. That was a treat. Okay, again, uh, that vegetable patch we had 
was 11 acres. And of course we had the two acre one, which was, I don't know if many of you can remember the old hotel market. Basically it was right in front of that. And more down to where that big mound of dirt sits today. And uh, I believe right off the White House, there's a new structure going in there. And that two acre patch uh, encompassed all that area. Finally, the old gardens went out of, went out of production. It was due mainly to mill expansion. And that was about the time old Dwight Eisenhower was 34th president of the United States. And everybody, I think, liked Ike. At least that was the button that you wore. By that time, uh, I was getting ready to look close at becoming part of the workforce at the mill. However, I wasn't quite old enough, so together with Bill Walker back here, we all headed out to Hughes Brothers Market Gardens, which is located where that big university school is they built here, uh, just east of Missoula, and extended all the way out to East Missoula. I worked there for a, a few years, uh, along with Bill, <coughs> and then, I got old enough to work in the mill, a buck ninety-eight an hour. Man, that was big money. And I had this really neat little girlfriend that I met out of Hughes's, sitting right over here, beats up on me quite frequently when I mouth off. <laughs> that was 58 years ago. Actually, when we were dating, I think, well, I'm gonna let the cat out of the bag on this one. That's getting close to 60 years ago. <laughs> she still puts up with me. <laughs> anyway, the mill would eventually close its doors, and I, I think with a lot of other folks, couldn't believe that this was happening, but it did. We ate up all our logs. Uh, we just couldn't run at the capacity that we were running at. So I kind of went into a period of depression. This great little town that I grew up in is going to go away, or is it? And some great folks, Judy Madsen and Gary and uh, Jim Willis and a few of these guys, come up with this history center. And uh, I, along with uh, Lee Legren here and, and uh, Willie Bateman, we became part of that to preserve the old memories that we had. And things started looking up. The houses, people were moving back in, hanging curtains in the windows, there's kids playing outside them. It's gonna return, but under a different, a different setting. The uh, savage conditions of the weather, if you were out here in those days, it was damn cold. That Blackfoot wind was miserable. And when we planted our big gardens, we waited until the snow up here on Crystal Peak melted out of that little clear patch on top, and then we started preparing the ground. After that, I found out that there was a lady who was gonna help me today, Jennifer has a way of growing some of the finest lettuce you'll ever taste. I've had a chance to taste that lettuce. And man, what a dinner salad you can make with that. And uh, not only is she good at that, but she's talented in many other ways. You know, I don't think there's a better front end loader operator around. <laughs> and I've had my... <laughs> so anyway, that's, that's my part of this presentation. I'll be open to questions or comments uh, for anybody that might, might have a question about what we used to do. I think the success of the whole project was out here at Bonner, there was a can-do attitude. 
if you run a certain way or you operated a machine a certain way, it was acceptable. But somebody always looked at it and says, well, what if we change this a little bit? An example, I'm thinking, and I'll talk about the woods crew, a McGiffin, McGiffert loader. Okay, big old donkey engine in there, big old water barrel, 300 gallon barrel. Fire that thing up. Imagine working on that thing in August. Somebody says, hey, why don't we put, let's knock that old donkey engine out of here. Let's get our machinist to make us a coupler to put a flathead forward in its place and hook up to those winches. We come up with a slide jammer. Again, somebody looked at that slide jammer and says, you know, there's some machinery companies out here that are making some pretty slick stuff. Let's look at this. So this attitude out here, this can-do attitude from this mill, I think is what took it from successfully from a lumber producer to now. I don't know what all is going on over here. I do know they make beer, and I've tasted that beer, and it's not bad. <laughs> so with that. I think we've got a question, a couple of questions. Okay, question. I wanted to ask you about that Hughes Brothers Garden. Okay. You said it ran from Montana Tech over to East Missoula. So what was that? Was that just for um, the market in Missoula, or what did that, what was that run for? Pretty much uh, Missoula, but also the eastern part of Montana. Really? We shipped a lot of stuff to a, a grocery firm called Gamble Robinson, and then I believe what was a bill about every every third night we'd have a Safeway truck Wow! with a refrigerated unit on come in there and old Ben would pay us a little bit of overtime to load that Safeway truck, get it out on the road so they had a wide circulation Wow <clears throat> So with all the innovation that we had on here, did you guys make steam powered rototillers to till up soil or how did you till the soil? Oh, they had a fellow they had a fellow, uh, this is, I'm going back into my time period. His name was uh, Walter Lurch. Had a Fordson tractor. Walter was kind of like me, a little shorter, round, round as all get out. Held that tractor down pretty damn good. <laughs> He'd come out here in the spring of the year and till that up. And then it would be remarked, you know, and the plots laid out. But what made those plots so good was the fact that they were located right where the exercise yard was for the draft animals, the horses. So when they were busy doing number two out there, they stomped it in the ground. All we had to do was just plow it up and plant some really magnificent plants in it. <laughs> Glenn, what happened to all the topsoil? That was a that was a sad thing. About the time Timberjack was being filmed, the stole mill was being modernized. We got an extra teepee burner, and uh, that soil was pushed aside, graded off, and uh, it was converted to a log yard. It had to have a firmer base than muddy old topsoil. So the topsoil, one load in particular, well, in fact, several loads in particular, went to the home of a fellow by the name of Jack Root. He was the mill manager at the time. Uh, he was just retiring and he had a brand new home built on the corner of Central and Arthur in Missoula here. His daughter lived just across the street from him. So a lot of that soil went to building projects like that. And today those lawns are just as nice and green as you'd ever want to see. And. Uh, I kind of get a catch in my throat when I drive by them and see what was, but there it is in my mind. But uh, I don't think too many folks might know about that. Some of that soil I'm sure went to different, different locations, but that's the two that I can remember. Uh, I'd like to go back to an earlier statement. I want to make sure I understood it. And that 11-acre plot, <clears throat> They were 33 foot wide, 80 foot long. 
But did you say yeah. somebody else weeded them? You didn't have to weed them? Yeah, we did. We did. Usually, depending on who your parents were. <laughs> <laughs> My wife over here is an authority on particular picking potato bugs. And uh, there were there were some some gardeners out here. One that comes to my mind is Mrs. Otterson. You guys remember Mrs. O Helen? Very, very particular. No weeds allowed, man. That was a cardinal sin to have a weed anywhere. <laughs> Come to find out, I guess, Jim Willis was telling me that Hazel moved on, or not Hazel, but Helen moved on, and where she had her berry patch outside her house with absolutely no weeds, is now grown over with every kind of weed you can imagine and a car parked on top of it. <laughs> so I don't imagine Helen would have been too appreciative of that. Helen could be a little overbearing at times. And here, here's, a, here's a Huck Finn story about Helen. When she got too overbearing, her garbage can would mysteriously wind up on top of the roof on her woodshed. <laughs> Remember that, Bill? <laughs> so, but I think she was a good-hearted lady. But, I mean, you got to, at that time, you know, if you felt pressured, you needed to retaliate somehow, so we put it up on the roof. And I wasn't sure I should feel bad about that or not, but Buck Lady, who was one of our truck drivers out here, he was responsible for carrying the garbage over here to the Milltown dump. And Buck commented that that was the easiest garbage pickup he had because he just had to back up to the woodshed and tip the barrel over in the back of his truck and away he went. <laughs> okay. I got one more question. Um, I think you said in addition to the big plots that were in the um, Victory Gardens or community gardens, the women would have little uh, salad gardens outside the door. Is that right? Yeah. So and, uh, wh what kind of things did they have in there, do you think? Okay, uh, berries, raspberries. Uh, they, had, they did grow some of their leaf lettuce there because some of these ladies are real particular about their leaf lettuce. And uh, I, rem I mainly remember the, the fruits, raspberries, strawberries, that sort of thing that would complement in the summertime, would complement a, a dinner. And I'll have to say, speaking of dinners, these ladies would put up and preserve these vegetables that they grew to get them through the winter months. I believe some of the finest dinners that I've had out here was made with these home processed, home grown vegetables. The main course for the meal, if it was meat, was usually elk or venison, most generally coming out of Johnson Creek and Sheep Mountain. So these are memories I have of this. I, I, I have been fortunate enough to travel Germany, France. I've eaten all over the world, as you can tell. And there's no finer cuisine than that that was grown here in Bonner, along with meat that come off Sheep Mountain. That was about the best. <laughs> Any other questions? How am I doing for time? You ready to start throwing stuff at me? <laughs> Okay, I have one question. Oh, um, I find you very interesting. Um, I find you very interesting, and thank you for enlightening me about Bonner. But um, have and I'm new to this, you know, this whole idea of Bonner Historical Society. Have you documented all of your knowledge and has? There. Are you? There's Good. two okay. ladies that I cannot take my hat off to enough. Bidey and, and uh, Judy here have documented a lot of that stuff. They have gone well beyond anything I ever hoped for. So I am proud to be a part of this team just because of their efforts. 
Well, I just think it's marvelous, this information, and, and it's not being lost. Um, thank you for all of that. So am I. Yeah. I didn't want to see this go away. It was great. <laughs> okay. So we're going to do things a little differently than our normal programs, and we're going to take a brief intermission right now and, and uh, set things up a little differently. Our next part is Jennifer Stackpole, and she's going to bring us up into the computer age of raising the greatest lettuce that you've ever tasted, as he said. So enjoy some veggies, and uh, there's cookies over there too if you want some of those. Uh, take a coffee break, and we'll be back in about five minutes. Well, everybody, let's get started on the next half of the program. I want to begin by thanking uh, Sharon and Judy and Gary and Max Glenn Hooligan Smith. I'm not really sure what's behind all of those. I think that might be another roundtable discussion, maybe over at the Kettle House. <laughs> right? Uh, I'm Jennifer Stackpole. I own Wicked Good Greens. It is over here in Bonner. Uh, I, of course, it's in Bonner. It's at the mill. And um, I put together a little slideshow for us so you could get an idea of what's happening, what I do. This backdrop, this is the inside of my shipping container. You'll see more pictures of it on the in the slides. If you have any questions, you can interrupt me. I'll hand you the mic. Um, please, if I go too fast or if you can't hear me, let me know and, you know, we're all in this together. So a hundred years later in Bonner, Montana, the arrival of the leafy green machine. It's 40 feet long, it's nine feet wide, eight feet high. Actually, it might be nine feet high and eight feet wide. It doesn't really matter. It's a shipping container. It's an insulated, upcycled, refrigerated shipping container. It's really cool. Wicked Good Greens, it's a space age hydroponic farm. Here are the brains that run the farm. I'm a chef and I didn't want to spend 16 hours a day in a restaurant getting $9 an hour and being screamed at. So I decided to stay in the food business, I would grow lettuce. It's also, nobody grows lettuce in Missoula in the winter, as you know we have a very short growing season. So this way, I can stay in the food business. I'm still walking into kitchens. I'm talking to chefs, talking about pairing foods and plating foods. And so I still get to be in the business, just an indifferent aspect of it. Right, Ooh, oh wait, I'm new to this technology. You wouldn't believe that. Right, this is the brain that runs the inside of the farm. I can run this farm on my smartphone. I can be in Hawaii on the beach and I can see what's happening inside my farm in Bonner, Montana. I mean, it's wicked high tech. Uh, there, uh, this, this picture is uh, taken by Briny Schwan right over here. I'm concussing a tomato. I'm peeling a tomato the fast way. Here's the, here are the essentials that I need to run my farm. A garden hose and a 60 amp extension cord. That's all this farm runs on. Uh, the mill has set up all of that for me. I, I can, I'm set up to run two farms if I wanted to bring another one in. Uh, the, the hose here is, is uh, it's an insulated hose. It's actually got, instead of wrapping heat tape around a hose, it's got a wire going through the hose that keeps the hose warm in the winter. It's never frozen on me. If it did, it would not be good. Here are the seeds. I use a pelletized seed. It's a, it's a seed that has a ceramic coating on it that has nutrients in it. And it, uh, it's, they're easy to plant. You can see them. I plant them with tweezers. Here I am planting, I plant 200 seeds at a time. Every week, I plant 200 seeds. These are the seed trays you can see. Oh, I keep hitting the wrong button. These are the seeds that, that are in each cell. Three days after I plant these seeds, I have seedlings. This is the seedling bay. It is uh, lit by red and blue lights, which is the only spectrum of light that photosynthesis needs to happen. Doesn't need any other spectrum other than blue and red. 
And these, there, this is when I was ramping up the farm. This is about 800 seedlings. When I started, I planted the farm almost completely. Yes, yes, you'll, yeah, it, it'll make sense to you in a minute. So, so the, here they get, they're getting bigger. The, the right here, oh, I've got to use my pointer. They're ready to transplant. Uh, this, this is a week, this is two weeks. Am I in the way? Yes. It's it's a it's a peat moss polymer medium. It is compostable in a worm farm. These are the little plugs. These are ready to transplant. This is after two weeks. And these are the towers. You can see here. Oops, I did it again. Here are the towers. There's 256 towers. This farm is equivalent to two and a half acres of land. I can grow over 3,000 heads of lettuce in this farm. It, that's huge. This is the future of farming. It will not replace farming in the ground, but it, it's, it will add to it. Yes? What's the point of the blue and red light? Is that more economical? Or? It's not about economics. It's about photosynthesis. So that, that's the color of the spectrum that you need, that photosynthesis needs to, to happen. I, you know, it's the spectrum of blue and red. I, I'm not sure the frequency number of it. But you can, it's not like Kelly Green and cobalt blue and light blue and sky blue. It's like some specific frequency of blue and red. So, and it, it, you'll see, there's a, there's a picture of my farm lit up. So the grow towers are seven feet tall, and there's 256 of them. And inside of them is the grow media, which is made from recycled bottles just like your Patagonia jackets or your, your uh, polyester jackets that we all wear. Here's the grow media right here. Um, there, there are two sections per tower. In the middle is, here, so here's one section, and then from the here to the middle back is another section. You pull those sections out and you transplant into them. Here, here I'm transplanting all the little, th this is a cotton wicking strip that you put on each tower, and that holds the water that keeps the plugs wet. Does that make sense? Am I explaining it very well? If you don't understand, just stop me. You grunted. Oh, okay, excuse me. She's burping over here, just want you to know. It wasn't a grunt. So here, here are the, the, the uh, seedlings in the tower, a little close up of them. And now they're growing. I, they're, it's a vertical tower. And so I lay them all out. I fold the, fold the medium over. And then I slide the medium into the tower. And then I hang the tower. One of the cool things about this farm, it's ergonomically correct. So I'm not bent over. I'm not on my knees. I'm not picking up weeds. Everything I do in the farm, I'm doing standing up. So it's not hard on your body. Continued growth, they just get bigger and bigger and bigger. That's what happens, it's farming. This is the farm lit up. For 18 hours, my farm looks like this. The lights are on, the fans are going, the water's running, and it happens, it starts at two o'clock in the afternoon, and it goes until eight o'clock in the morning. And it's just growing like crazy. It's a perfect environment. You have CO2, light, uh, circulation and nutrients, and you get growth. There's no bugs, there's no weather issues, there's no light issues, there's no weeds. It's a perfect growing environment. So everything grows really fast. And this is lettuce. You don't see this kind of lettuce growing out of the ground very often. It's beautiful, it's perfect. The yield on it, when you buy a head of romaine, you have to peel off you know, two or three layers of the outside leaves, right? Not this. Outside leaves are as good as the inside leaves. That's uh, lettuce and some rainbow chard. I mean, look at it. It's lovely. I never thought I would be so into lettuce. I mean, I look at heads of lettuce, I'm like, oh my god, this is a great head of lettuce. It's like, what am I, this is my life. 
So I tried an experiment. Everybody always asks me, what else can you grow in here? Now the towers, these towers are only four inches. So I can't grow root vegetables. But I tried to grow some radishes. And they're little French specialty radishes. They're short. And you can eat the tops. So you get, you get double, double use out of your crop. You eat the bottom and you can eat the top. And I thought, th this, is, this is perfect. Well, you can see they're really ugly. Look at this. I mean, they're ugly, ugly. I couldn't sell them. And it was like they just they grew rectangularly. <laughs> and then instead of growing like into the towers, they grew out of the towers. And then the lights would dry them out. They were delicious, but you know they weren't a, a crop that I could sell. Some happy customers. This was my first sale at Buttercup Market over here. Uh, it was very exciting. And a couple of happy customers wearing my hats at the farmer's market. And here is my delivery vehicle. And you know, these guys have not passed their driver's test. I don't understand why. <laughs> so I do deliver. Yeah, you can come home from work and there'll be a fresh bag of lettuce in your refrigerator. I mean, do, uh, I didn't mean like, but you do all the delivery. I do, I, 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 am, I, am the, I am the one person army. Um, so I, I wanted to start out, I'm gonna back up a little bit. I live in Potomac and I, last year I was coming into town and I, you know, we dri I drive by the, mar the museum all the time and I'm always looking like, what is that place? And it looked really cool. So I'm at the farmer's market and my booth is set up next to Sharon who sells the best jams on the planet. If I'm sure a lot of you in here who've, who have had them. And we traded one day a jar of lettuce, a, pff, a jar of lettuce, <laughs> a head of lettuce and a jar of jam. Well, the next week I go to the market and she said, my husband said that you had that, it was the best lettuce that he has ever eaten. And I thought, wow, that's pretty good. Cause you know, I'm, I'm sure that you're probably a connoisseur of meat and potatoes, right? Yeah, I bet vegetables, you know, I bet they're like, they get on the, put on the plate last. <laughs> and so I was like, wow, that's great, you know. And so I go, I'm driving by one day, and uh, you know, on Tuesdays, they all congregate for coffee. Well, it was Tuesday, and it was 9.30, and I saw all the cards, and I thought, well, I'm going to go stop in. I had no idea, never been in there, never met Glenn, knew nobody. I walked in the door, didn't know anybody, walked in the door, and I just, everybody turns and looks at me, and I didn't introduce myself, and all I said was, who here has had the best lettuce they've ever had? And he just starts beaming. <laughs> and he's like, oh, you must be the lettuce lady. And I'm like, Ugh, yeah, that's me, that's me. So that's how, that's how I came to be here, is uh, they asked me if I would come in and talk about, in the 100-year anniversary, farming today in Bonner. And that's what, that's, but it was a great, it was, and I knew that was not going to be the last time I, I went into the museum. It was really, they're, they're a great bunch of people. So the farmer's market. This was the winter market. Sharon is right here. Her booth is right here, going, selling jams like crazy. This is the market up in Sealy Lake that I do. I just park my little truck right, right underneath my, right behind my tent and sell out of that. Yeah, they're kind of dark, sorry. This is the winter market here, the Missoula winter market. If you haven't been, you should go. There's one more, and then we're going into the Clark Fork market. Not, I'm not there right now. Seely starts, um, when's Father's Day? I think it starts that weekend. It's when it usually starts. Oh, it goes all into October. Yeah, last winter, last summer, obviously, it was pretty tough with the, with the fires. Sunday. Sealy Lake Market is Sunday. Well, I, and I'm hoping, and you're the first to know, that I have been building big sandwich board signs, and I'm going to be selling lettuce across from the post office on the green this summer. And so you'll see all my little sandwich signs out there, and I haven't picked a day of the week, and so I'll be out there selling lettuce. I, I don't do the markets in Missoula. There's plenty of people selling lettuce. I tend to go places where people aren't selling lettuce, and that's why I go to Sealy Lake. And it's a great market up there. So there's 35 vendors up there. It's a really fun farmer's market. So, that, so this is what happens. You know, a, as the mill grew, the gardens, the gardens stopped growing because the mill needed the space for the gardens. Happens today. The more we develop land, 
the less space we have to garden in. Like I said, this is an, alt this is an addition to what's happening, but we, you know, we, we need to maintain our ground so we can keep growing food. We're, we're all here. Now, there is a guy in Missoula who is working with NASA to put a hydroponic farm on Mars. Now you think, I'm space age. If we're, having to, if we're having to get lettuce from Mars, we're in a world of hurt right here on this planet. Let me tell you that. <laughs> yes. That'll only be available to certain people. This is true. <laughs> could, you, could, you just explain, could you just explain that growing medium again that are in the towers? It's, it's made from recycled PET bottles. That's all it is, and then you have the cotton wicking strip that you lay on those, and then you lay your plugs on those strips and fold the strip over, slide it into the tower, hang your tower. The nutrients are right here. This is the dosing panel. Um, there, there's a set of bottles that sit here that have all the liquid nutrients, and the liquid nutrients are pretty much minerals for, that come from the earth. And it's, I use a special lettuce mixture. And there's sensors all over the farm this here is the main tank. It's a 148-gallon tank. There's sensors inside the tank that read the nutrient levels. If that water needs nutrients, these pumps start running, and they will dose for 30 seconds. They'll mix for two minutes. They'll reread and then dose accordingly. It's fully automated, totally fully automated. I give tours all the time, but you've just had one. But if you want to come over to the farm and see it, I'm happy to give a tour. You can get in touch with me through the museum, and, um, and I'm happy to give you a tour. It's really pretty cool, and it smells like lettuce. <laughs> I mean, who knows what lettuce smells like, right? You don't pick lettuce out of the ground and go, oh, this smells so good, you know? You just you do that with flowers. You don't do it with lettuce. This would be really good for herbs. You can grow herbs. You can grow any leafy greens. You have to grow like-minded things together. So I can't grow basil. Basil grows at 75 degrees. This farm is at 63 degrees. If I were to grow basil, uh, I would get powdery mildew everywhere. So you have to grow like-minded things together. So I use six gallons of water a day. That's it. My, my, uh, my carbon footprint with this farm is very, very small, which is one of the things that I love about it. You can stack these farms. You can, uh, you can stack up to three high. So you're, if you think about it, two and a half acres, you get five or six farms, you, there's a, you're not taking up a lot of space. But you're, create, you're growing a lot of food. Are they doing this all over the United States and the world? Montana, right now, there is a f two farms in Red Lodge, two farms in Bozeman, one here, one in Coeur d'Alene, one in Big Fork, all of these container farms. There are over 130 freight farms around the world right now, and the number is increasing. They're all over the world. It's not very much. The company's been in business for 10 years. Wow. So. But the ones in Montana all have the same Yep. Setup. Yep. Are those manufactured? They're manufactured in Boston. So they're up. So Yeah, right? Oh, is that where you're from? I should have called you to have it shipped out here. <laughs> Any questions? I grow butter lettuce, bib lettuce, romaine lettuce, mini head lettuce, any any kind of lettuce. If you want, if you want a specific kind, you can tell me. I'll grow it for you. Everybody has their favorite. Butter lettuce is everybody's favorite, a, as is romaine. The initial seed, the lettuce seed, uh, has a coating on it with nutrients in it. What is that coating? Though? It's ceramic. It's clay. So it breaks down really quick when it gets wet. Now the seeds, the seeds germinate for a week in, in, in a, um, just in their trays underneath a hood. So the, the plugs are wet. Seeds go in the plugs. The hood goes on the tray and then the condensation keeps those plugs wet for a week. Then it gets moved up into this shelf right here, and they live there for two weeks. After two weeks, they get transplanted into the towers. So when they put the, the clay on the seeds, does that preserve it longer too? Is that a point? I have no idea. You know how a seed only is so viable. Right, for so long. 
Right. Yeah, I think it does. I, I keep my seeds in a vacuum sealed camera case in the farm and and they're all in bottles inside my case. And I've never, I've had usually a 100% germination rate. So if I plant 200 seeds, I get 200 plants. We have a lot of questions. Sorry. There, um, no, I'd much rather use pelletized seeds. I plant with tr with tweezers, and there there are some seeds that I plant that I can barely see, and it's it takes me about 15 minutes to plug and seed a tray, and I do that every week. So I plug a tray, seed a tray, transplant a tray, harvest a tray. That I have no idea. It's not a job I would want to have. Putting clay on seeds? Mm -mm. I know. I don't know how they do that. Yep. That plastic medium on back to back, does the plant take that up? The roots, the roots root into that medium. No, 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 no. Apparently not. It's, it's uh, all the seeds I use are organic, and and um, I have not. There has never been a report of the PET uh, leaching into the plants at all. You've had my lettuce. You love my lettuce. Yeah, so it doesn't taste like PET. Not that I've eaten a PET bottle lately, but has anybody had one? Yes. Yes, I reuse that. Yes. Over and over and over. My shop vac is my best friend. Every time I, I clean the towers, I clean all the roots out, clean the wicking strips. I go down to the green hanger and I wash those wicking strips uh, in, in a certain, in a sanitizing solution that's, that's organic and I reuse the wicking strips, and I reuse everything. Yeah, it's really cool. Yes? You mentioned I saw Swiss charts. The mm -hmm. lettuce sounds really good to me, but I go into withdrawal when my <laughs> Swiss chart crop is... Well, I better start growing you some. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where's that Swiss, Swiss chart? chart? takes about the same temperature, obviously. Yeah. Yes, yes. And as you can see, look how shiny it is. Yeah. It's amazing. Everything in this farm comes, I, I know, it's, and it's delicious. It's delicious. Yes? Um, with the timing cycle, does everyone, does all plants have to grow at night? I mean, how did you pick? Because I'm in there working in the day. So it's nighttime is my daytime. So at 8, so at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, it goes into, it goes into grow, into the grow mode. And it goes all night long. Nobody's in the farm. It's easy. You can't really work in there. I have some glasses that add, because you're in a red and blue spectrum. If you add green to that, everything looks reasonably normal. But I, I, wear, I they don't make seeing eyeglasses in green. So I don't, I don't use them. I, if I'm in there after 2 o'clock, I just shut the system down. I shut the lights off, and then I turn them on before I leave. But I can be sitting in my living room and literally see exactly there's a camera I got cameras all through it I can see everything that's going on inside the farm the problem is if there is a problem you need a human to walk in the door somebody has to walk in the door to fix the problem so if I'm in Hawaii and there's a problem it's it's a problem yes it sounds like there's a pretty high overhead with all this technology what's your private <coughs> market uh, it depends on how many customers I have uh, my customer base changes all the time. And the electricity, I thought by putting the farm on an industrial site, I would be paying uh, less per kilowatt hour, especially with Bitcoin here and with everything that's going on in the mill. But I pay quite a bit. I pay 10 cents a kilowatt hour. And uh, up in my house in Potomac, I pay 7 cents. So much for me doing my homework. Yes? What? Um is approximate cost on one of these grow units or a farm? If you were to buy one of these today, straight farm, no shipping, no preparation for winter, it's going to cost you about eighty-five thousand dollars. You probably you can add another twenty on top of that to get it ready and for shipping. 
So it's, it's uh, you know, you're paying for the technology for sure. And it's heated with the lights. There are 200, uh, there's 128 strands of lights. That the, the lights are all these white. These are the lights. If the farm gets cold, the lights turn on. Now, there are, they're LED. People say, well, the LED don't heat. They do heat. They're very, very warm. It's the only thing. When it's, when it's 30 below zero in Bonner, my air conditioner is running to keep that farm cold enough. You know, so it's a balancing act. So I'm the lab tech that keeps the balance inside the farm. Do you have a backup generator in case the electricity dies? Um, the farm will last for three days. After that, it's the, it's the mill's responsibility to keep my farm running. They have, they have the sheet that tells them if my farm loses power, they will bring it back online. And it's their responsibility. So no, I personally don't. I rely on the mill. Yes, sir. Do you have any idea what the cost of production is compared to like traditional gardening done in soil? Is, uh, is lettuce more economically produced in a outfit like yours or on the ground? I would say I haven't actually done those numbers. I am not a gardener. I mean, I am so not a gardener. I'm only a gar I'm only a lab tech here. Uh, so I don't know, I'm, I'm not a lettuce grower. I would imagine with, you know, it depends. If you have bad weather, if you have a bug infestation, if you, I mean, it depends upon, since this is a perfect growing environment, I can predict what I can produce out of here, where is a farmer in, a, in, in gardens, they don't know. Their yield is different. So when you get a big old head of lettuce from me, it's, you can use 99% of that. R a restaurant can use 60% of that. So there's a lot of variables that happen there. Yeah, the weather's a big one. What do you charge for a head of lettuce? Um, I charge, to a restaurant, I charge $1.50 a head, and depends upon the lettuce, it could be two fifty to $3 a head to, to, for retail. Depends on how long I let it grow. Hydroponic lettuce, are th it's lighter than dirt-grown lettuce. So when a restaurant orders five pounds from me, if they order, if you were to take a bag from grown in the ground and grown in a f hydroponic farm, you're going to get a lot more lettuce from me because it's lighter. Mm -hmm. How long does it take from the time you plant the seed till? Again, it depends upon the variety. Uh, anywhere from four to six weeks. So and now you don't get that growing in the ground. You only get a certain amount of days to grow in. And I saw that Missoula really, ne ne there was a need for greens in the winter. When I go to the winter market, people can't believe how good, how, how the fact that they're getting fresh greens grown right here in Montana. And I have this backdrop and you know, it helps me tell the story because this is exactly what my farm looks like. And this is, this is probably shot in the winter. I mean, it's green, it's lovely. Yes? How many heads of lettuce do you produce on a, a, on a special kind? How many heads do you generally produce? I will usually plant 200, which is about 14 towers. And, and then if, if there's a chef in town that's doing a wine tasting and they want me to grow something specific for that, like shiso or tatsoi, or, I will grow, I usually grow a whole flat, a whole 200 for that. And I, I sell everything. When I go to the winter market, I come home with nothing. You can attest to that. It's, I come home with empty coolers. I sell everything. So it's exciting. I'm the only one growing greens in Missoula in the winter. I'm it. Isn't that amazing? How many years have you been going? Uh, this, I'm going into a um, year and a half. Wow. Yeah. And I really, I mean, I, it was really s flying by the seat of my pants. Yeah, uh, we went to farm school for two days in Boston. Did I learn anything? Not really. I mean, you know, you get the container, it shows up on site, and you hit the ground running. They send out a, an engineer. Um, I had done most of the things that the engineer required because I'm me and I could do that thanks to Mike Heisey who really helped me out in leveling the farm. Um, and 
a after that, you just start planting and you figure it out. Every time I, I'm in there, I figure out something new to do. How many hours do you work per day? About, I work about 20 hours a week, max. Yeah. I know. I'm I know. No, no. I mean, you can, there, it's farming, right? There's always something. You always have a list. It's like home ownership. There's always a list. Um, and so I do, I do 20 hours, but I could easily do more. Two days in Boston, farm school. Does that make sense? Huh? No, I, the nutrients that I use are, are for lettuce across the board. Even for the radishes, I use the, the lettuce nutrients. So each, each variety doesn't have its own nutrient. So I, u I use a, just a basic nutrient for everything. Is that the nutrient you use for Swiss chard as well? Yes. <laughs> yes. And, and what's also really fun for me is uh, you can see, like, there's one, there's one, there's one. There's another speaker over here. Oh, yeah, it's all Bluetooth. I'm dancing up and down the aisles. I'm like, woohoo, me and my lettuce, you know? I mean, it's, I have a lot of fun. It's fun. It's really a fun, it's not hard. It's time consuming, but it's a job, right? That's all, it's the way it is. So do you um, have music going when you're not there? For no, I know I should. Maybe that's, maybe that'd be a new fertilizer. <laughs> if I played music for the lettuce. But you know, I will tell you, uh, it, when it's at this stage, wait, backwards, backwards. When I first started, I would work the farm and I would leave the farm and I'd bend down and I'd say, okay, I'm going home now, you guys stay there. You know, I mean, I'd like talk to the lettuce. I got really attached to the lettuce, you know? Can you go back to the beginning little sprouty one? Oh no, that's it. Do you ever like, um, I learned in, uh, at a greenhouse and it was the class this year that if you run your hands over the seed and you trace them or before they get beyond the two leaf kind of thing, it's like physical therapy. Really? Yeah. Wow, you might be able to quit your day job for that one. You want to come caress my lettuce? <laughs> yeah. On your resume, lettuce caresser. <laughs> you got it, you're on. I'll give you a key. Uh, how long would it take you to sell lettuce to make up the $85,000 you're paying for? Two years. Wow. Two years. Two years. So it's all paid for now? No. No. Nope. But you know, I only work at, I only work at 20 hours a week. My farm is not full. So, um, and I if, the more customers I get, I mean, I just picked up a couple of private chefs and another catering company. Um, you know, the more customers I get, the more, the more I plant, the more hours it takes. It's farming. So you've been selling for two and a half years. For a year and a half. A year and a half. Mm -hmm. So your name will get big. You know, the farmer's markets are huge for me. People love, people can't believe, they're like, wow, how, how come I haven't heard of you, you know? But people are really starting to know who Wicked Good Greens. In fact, I had a student text me, a Hellgate High School student text me from class with a picture of my farm. They were studying hydroponics. And she said, look, look who we're talking about. So uh, Big Sky High School has come in several times and brought their students who are studying, studying science and space age things. And so they've come through. But I, I bring a lot of, um, the, the whole museum came in. What, there was like 14 of you guys in there. It's a lot, but we had fun. Question. Question. Yes. So. So I hate questions that start with so. <laughs> uh, okay, do I need to sit down? You're on the beach in Hawaii. Have you ever had to come home early because? No, what happened, the only, one of the big mishaps that happened is I was home, it was Early in the morning, I got a call from Mike Heisey, who runs the mill, and he said, Jen, there's water pouring out of your farm. And I was like, I'm on my way. And um, Marla, I don't know, some of you may know Marla, who used to work for, for the mill. 
Uh, she she's the only one that knew to turn off number 16. I don't have a box. I don't have a picture of the box that runs. I have a computer box. I need a lettuce sitter and a caresser. You're in. <laughs> Easy. So that so that happens occasionally. Um, things like you know it's again it's farming. Things happen. And this is no different. Even though it's a con in a container, it's a very clean, pristine, controlled environment, it's still farming. So um, that's, that's just the way it is. How did you have to get out of Stinson with it? I, does anybody here work for Missoula County Health Department? Or the county commissioners? I am being recorded, okay. Love those guys. <laughs> I asked, I, I, we went to um, Steve and Mike and asked them if they had space. And they said, we'd love to have you. And so I ended up putting it out here. And I have to say, it's a really cool place to be. There are so many cool things going on at the mill. And it's growing like crazy. And uh, there's so many entrepreneurial businesses there. It's really a really great place. And I love being out there. Yes. You give tours and uh, tours to school groups and all. Do you have any problems with uh, diseases, plant diseases getting into your I I did get a um, fungus gnat last summer. And, you know, to, a fungus gnat to me looks like a regular old little old fly, you know, until I became a freight farmer. And now a fungus gnat is a really big problem. I, I ended up having to, and I called, you, I get 24-7 support from this company. So if I have a problem, I can call them up. They can actually dial into my farm, and they can say, you need to do this or do this. They called me one day, and they said, your lights aren't coming on. And I went, oops, I forgot to hit number 12 in the box. So they, they noticed it, and they called me up, and they said, your farm is not lighting up. Your farm's not going into grow mode. Uh, it's really good support. Um, and so I got a fungus gnat, and I called Freight Farms, and I said, what do I do? I took pictures of it, and I sent it in, and they said, oh, you got a fungus gnat. You'll never get rid of it. Well, if you know me, you don't ever say you'll never do something, because I will figure out a way to do it. <laughs> and I did. I beat the fungus gnat, and it ate everything in my farm. All my lettuce was, I'd walk in the farm in the day, and the lettuce is laying on the ground. And I had to throw it out. Or give it to, I, actually now I give it to people who have chickens. And my donkeys, they love lettuce. Yes, I have two donkeys. So, um, so I got rid of the fungus gnat, but that, that you, you don't want to get white flies, fungus gnats, powdery mildew, all of those things you have to be very aware of and you have to know how to catch it quick. And so in the summer, I tend to not want to give as many tours because the minute that door opens, it takes one fly to fly in, and they think they've died and gone to heaven. So I'm in a church. I get to say that today. Um, so yeah, any more questions? So you going to put some more of these in the um, Probably not. Probably not. Um, so six gallons of water a day. That's pretty amazing. I mean, that's a very small footprint. I have my little green truck that I deliver in. So I try to keep everything as small as possible. But if you want lettuce, you call me. If you're at work, I'll go in your house and put it in your refrigerator. I mean, who does that? <laughs> <laughs> yes? What do you think about the possibility of raising something like beans or peas in this kind of? They grow too big. I'll tell you what. The thing that everybody asks me about, it do, they don't grow vertically well, for one thing, and they grow too big and bushy, because there's not a lot of space between here, you know, so, and everything grows towards the lights. Um, the number one crop that people ask me about is growing marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, what are you growing in there? It's like, I'm not growing marijuana. Besides, you could smell it. You think people complain about the sound around here? <laughs> Be a whole different set of complaints. Um, it doesn't grow, I, yeah, no kidding. It, marijuana doesn't grow vertically, and it also grows too big. And I'm not interested. So it doesn't, it's not, not, my, not my deal. I'm, I'm a lettuce farmer. So if anybody wants a tour, please, please get in touch with me. I'd be happy to show it to you. Yes? 
Johnny's Seeds, oh all organic. They're great, great seed company. I just bought 5,000 uh, butter lettuce seeds for $42. The pelletized seeds aren't cheap. But I get 100% I get germination out of them. So when I plant 200 seeds, I get 200 heads of lettuce. So it's reliable. I have, I grow something called wasabi arugula, which you all, anybody who comes to my farm gets to taste it. It's a lettuce, and it tastes just like horseradish, and it's delicious. It's my highest selling item. I can't keep it in stock. Tatsoi, yeah, tatsoi is another good one. Yes? Uh, there's a lettuce variety called Plato 2. Are you familiar with that I, one? I'm it's not. It's a type of a romaine that's really good that uh, I don't think Johnny's carries it. I, I right now, well, if you find some seeds, I'd love to try it. If you have any seeds, I'm sure I'd love to try it. Um, that's okay. They're probably, yeah, if I can see them, I can plant them. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, there is a seed library in Missoula. Does everybody know about the seed library? It's cool. You go to the library and you get free seeds. My plants came from Missoula and Boise. Nice. I, um, I planted some from the Flathead, and I don't remember the name of the company. Really beautiful lettuce. In fact, I think I have a picture of it. And it has little rust spots all over it. Yeah. No, actually, it wasn't this lettuce. It was lettuce and it had little, little red spots all over it. And one of my customers is Butterfly Herbs. And I would take, they, they just tell me, bring whatever you have. So I bring them some of this local seed lettuce. and. The, the manager of the cafe in there said he keeps picking it out of the garbage because his staff thinks some, something's wrong with it. And that's the thing. You're growing these incredible heads of lettuce that look really unusual. People don't know what it is. And so he said, don't bring me any more of that lettuce because he keeps picking it out of the garbage and telling his staff, this is good lettuce. And everybody thought it was going rotten. Are you referring to the seed library at the public library? Yes. Yeah, me too. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I've done this. Yeah, it's a, the seed library is a really, really cool thing. Yes? Bring any lettuce to sell? I didn't bring any lettuce. I know, we all could have had Caesars. Ho hold, hold on a sec. Yes? I'm just curious what drove you into this. Was it how do I make a living in Montana? Or I'm a chef and I haven't had good lettuce, so I'll grow my own. Or were you reading articles and you saw it in a magazine? What led you this direction? I actually saw an article about this company, and I just got all wiggly. And if you know me, when I get excited, I get all wiggly. And I just saw, I thought, this is like a perfect thing for Missoula. Because we get our lettuce from California. And by the time it gets all the way up here, it doesn't taste very good. You know, it's like, it's, you know. You just, if you did a taste comparison, you would be amazed at what this lettuce tastes like. It tastes like lettuce. It's not about the dressing. When you think about a salad, what do you think about? Hmm, what kind of dressing do I want tonight? It's not about the lettuce. This lettuce is all about the lettuce. It tastes like lettuce. It, it, you pair it well it, um, with dressing, and you have a perfect salad, as you can attest, Glenn Max Hooligan Smith. Right? Well, I really appreciate everybody coming. Thank you. It's been fun. Again, get in touch with me if you want to see the farm. Is this still on? Okay, so thank you for coming. Uh, please, we have a few more minutes. Uh, enjoy some more veggies. Unfortunately, not lettuce, but you can talk to Jennifer about that. And uh, thank you again, and we will see you um, in the future next January when we start over again with our programs. Have a good summer. <laughs>